All right, hello, this is Melissa, the insurance exam queen. We're gonna go ahead and get started with our game, PNC Basics. If for whatever reason you get kicked out, the instructions will be at the bottom of the screen and you can join back in. If you're still having tech issues, just follow along with us, um, write your answer down or, or memorize it in your head, see how well you're doing, keep, keep your own score. And we'll be learning so much throughout this game because I'll always explain the, the topics to you. So let's go ahead and get started. You want to actually pull out the chat box, but then hide this. Sorry, Zoom has too many things I have to look at. All right, there we go. You guys can't see on my end, but on my screen, Zoom puts all these other little boxes everywhere. So it's tricky sometimes. And then get rid of the video. I don't need that. All right, here we go. And you'll catch on pretty quickly. They'll show you the question. And then the next screen will be the answers. And then you answer on your phone according to the color. Actual cash value is defined as, what do we define actual cash value as? So you see, you've got the colors at the bottom, your phone will have those squares of colors, and then you pick your answer. You'll have as much time to answer it as the little timer over here, or until everyone answers, it will um, ping out. All right. Ooh. We got this one. We got this one in the bag. All right. So actual cash value is that used value. It means that we've we've owned it, we've touched it, we've used it before. It's the goodwill value. So when insurance companies pay you out, like if I, if this laptop, if I, if it, if my office burned up in a fire, and they go to pay me for my laptop, they're not going to give me brand new money. They're not going to give me enough money to go to Best Buy and buy this laptop. They're going to give me enough money to go on Craigslist, on Facebook Marketplace, right? It's the used value of your item that insurance companies pay you out for. And your homeowners and your auto are, are automatically actual cash value for all your stuff. So for your clothes, your shoes, your furniture, and for the car itself, it's actual cash value. An actual cash value is defined as replacement cost, AKA brand new value, walk into Best Buy and buy it brand new out of the box value, minus depreciation, minus the fact that you've touched it and you've owned it. So again, actual cash value is the goodwill value, the, the marketplace value, the offer up value, the Poshmark value, Wherever it is you buy used goods, the garage sale value, maybe not as bad. I think garage sales are a little bit lower, but the point is, is it's not brand new. It's not the brand new price. It's brand new minus depreciation, minus wear and tear. Now, a couple of you chose green and I don't think you chose it because you thought it was the right answer. I think you chose it because you missed that it said plus instead of minus. That is one word off from the correct answer. And the state exam can do this to you as well. You have to make sure you slow down and read the question and make sure that you're, you're choosing the one that you want to legitimately choose. So replace actual cash value is replacement cost minus depreciation. We're gonna subtract, and depreciation is just a fancy way of saying wear and tear. You've owned it, you've touched it, you've used it, you've stretched it out. It's not brand new, it's not out of the box. That would, that's what depreciation means. <clears throat> so replacement cost minus depreciation is actual cash value. And make sure you pay attention because even though they've got the word, we, we put in the word depreciation into every answer here, but you've got to slow down and make sure you're looking for minus depreciation when it comes to actual cash value. All right, and again, let me know if you have any questions, um, either just unmute or, or put in the chat box, but I'm just gonna keep going as we go. All right, and then we keep score, but I'll kind of skip through these. 
it really doesn't matter to me like who's scoring the highest, although great job, CJ. He's taking his test soon. You get um, points for being fast and correct. But ultimately, it doesn't matter. You're, it doesn't matter what, who, who ends up winning, right? What matters is that you're learning, you're growing, and you're monitoring and checking your progress, okay? All right, so next question. Cause of loss. What is cause of loss? That should be an easy one. <laughs> All right, peril, yes, the cause of loss is peril. So peril is the fire, the lightning, the wind, the hail. It's the reason why we file a claim. So apparel is the cause of loss. What is a physical hazard? Material and structural, yes. So a physical hazard is something that you can see and you can touch it. So the fancy way of saying material and structural, but it's ultimately something you can see and touch. You can see and touch material. You can see and touch structure. So this would be examples of like a rickety staircase. Um, like you can see the railing is broken or the wood is splintered. You could see like maybe in the, the road, where uh, there's a pothole, that would be in a physical hazard. Physical hazards could be a low hanging tree branch over the roof. It's things that you can see and touch that are in the physical environment. And um, they lead to, they, they are more likely to create a loss if you have a physical hazard. You're more likely to have a claim if physical hazards are present. So like in insurance, especially with homeowners, they want to they want to look at the house and they'll do homeowners inspections and they're looking to see how the house is built if there's anything wrong with the structure of the house or if there's anything missing like how does the roof look um is there any like uh siding coming off is the is the foundation sturdy they look at different things when they're insuring a house to be checking for physical hazards and some insurance companies won't offer you coverage until you make repairs to your home because they don't want to be on the hook for, for claims that, because like if your house is like falling apart, you're more likely to suffer a claim than not. So they want to make sure that everything is on the up and the up before they actually offer you insurance. So, cause it's, there's a lot of physical hazards present in houses. All right. So material and structural. All right. Hang on to the next question. Direct losses also include. So what is part of a direct loss? What is included in a direct loss? Proximate cause of loss. Okay, <clears throat> so looking at our answer choices here, four of you chose indirect loss. It's important to know that Direct and indirect are completely opposite. They're not together, okay? So you either have a direct loss or an indirect loss. Direct is everything that is happening in the moment of danger. So if the house, if there's a house that's burning, everything that's happening while the house is burning is a direct loss, including the fire truck coming along and spraying water on the house. So the water is entering the house. Now let's say the fire is only upstairs. But because of the way the fire hose works, the water is draining down into the lower part of the house. And now you have a wet kitchen, you have wet walls, you have wet furniture that are not burned in a fire, but are now destroyed because of the water. That the water loss is typically outside water coming in is excluded. 
if you were to, if you were to, you know, be playing around with the hose and, and you accidentally sprayed water into your house and it damaged your floor or damaged your furniture, there's no coverage for that. If a, if a um, sprinkler was running and your windows were open and water comes in, there's no coverage for that. So they don't cover the rain even. If you leave your windows open and rain comes in, there's no coverage for that. They don't like outside water coming in. But in the instance where the house is burning and the fire truck comes along and water is being sprayed in, all of that would be covered under the peril of fire. The wet walls and the wet furniture would be proximate cause of loss. Proximate is like proximity. It's close to, it's next to. It, it only happened because of the fire. So direct losses is everything in the danger zone, moment of fire, fire is burning, fire is raging, everything that's happening in that moment, including the wet furniture and the wet walls is, is direct loss. So direct loss includes proximate cause of loss. Indirect loss, on the other hand, is completely separate. Indirect loss are the things that happen after the claim, after the fire is done. It's, it's the aftermath. The danger zone is done. The fire has been put out. The, the fire fighters go home and you're left there with a burned down house. And you say, now what? Everything that you've got to deal with in the now what is the, is the indirect loss. Like now I have to go stay at a hotel. Now I'm losing profits because my business burned down. If a, after a car accident, now I have to go to the hospital. I'm missing out on work, right? So indirect losses are the things that happen after the moment of danger, after the damage is done, after the injuries are caused. So direct and indirect are complete opposite. Direct is everything in the moment of danger, fire is burning, fire is raging, including proximate cause of loss, like the fire or the, the water on the walls. Indirect is the aftermath or also known as consequential. The consequences of the house burning down is that I have nowhere to live. I have to stay at a hotel. The consequences of the car accident are that I'm stuck in the hospital and I can't go to work. So indirect is, is the consequences of the direct. I know we sometimes, and this is where people will think, well, wet walls are a consequence to the fire. I know, but wet walls are happening in the moment of danger and insurance companies will cover the wet walls. So wet walls are proximate cause of loss. That's the most common example on the exam for proximate cause of loss. So direct includes proximate, indirect is completely separate. <clears throat> the maxima available for payment of bodily injury to a single person in an accident. What do we call that? Limit liability. Okay, all right. So this is where things get a little funky and I'm almost tempted to, to kind of draw this out, but I don't have my whiteboard set up. Okay, so let's kind of break this down. So follow along with me and ask questions. We're going to start with limits of liability. Limits of liability is what is available on the entire policy. And everything has its own limit. There's not one specific thing that is limit of liability because aggregate yellow is a limit of liability. Per occurrence is a limit of liability for each occurrence. Per person is a limit of liability for each person. So everything is a limit of liability, but when we think of limits of liability, what you wanna think is the max the insurer will pay for that one thing that we're talking about. So if we're talking about a policy in total, the limit of liability would be the aggregate because aggregate is the max total for the entire policy. Like if you were to use your car insurance multiple times, accident after accident, claim after claim, at some point, the insurance company is going to go, we're done. That's enough. We can't pay you anymore. That's the aggregate limit. So that's the maximum li limit of liability for the entire policy. But then within the aggregate, you have per occurrence. 
per occurrence is how much they pay you for each individual accident. So there is a set limit, a limit of liability for each accident that you have. So let's think about car insurance, like the average, the most common state minimum is like 25, 50, 25, meaning that you get $25,000 per person up to a total of $50,000 bodily injury and 25 per uh, property damage. That is the limit, and that's a split limit, by the way. That is a per occurrence limit. That is, that's how much money you get for every single accident. If your accident is more money than that, it doesn't matter. Your insurance is done when you hit the per occurrence limit. So per occurrence is the limit of liability for each individual accident that you have. Then within per occurrence, we have bodily and property, which are not listed here. So you have a bodily injury liability limit. This is the max amount of money the insurer will pay for all injuries to people's bodies. And the most common number is 50,000. If you hurt people up to 100,000, the insurer is still only paying 50 because that is the limit of liability for bodily injury. Then with bodily injury, they break it down even further and they have per person. So per person is the max available that each person can collect. Now, they may get less than that, especially if their injuries are less than that. Like if you crashed into me and you've got 25 per person, but my injuries are only 5,000, I'm only going to get 5,000. But if my injuries are 50,000 and you only have 25 per person, I'm only going to get 25. But if you ended up injuring a lot of people, I might have to share that that limit, I might not even get the 25 just because that's the per person limit. I might end up getting less than that because you hurt a lot of people. But ultimately the bodily injury is the total per occurrence for all bodily injury and the whole accident. And then they break it down even further and they have per person. So that's like the 25, 50, 25. The 25 number is the per person limit, how much each, the max available that each person can collect. The middle number, 50,000, is the total for all bodily injury. Basically, it's saying you can hurt two people at 25,000 each if your limit is 2550. The last number, 25,000, is for property damage. That's how much money you have available for their car. So if I crash into you and I damage your car, the most I have available to fix it is 25,000. And that's every, all damage. If I crash into one car or 10 cars, if I crash into your car, a light pole, a stop sign in a building, it's crazy my car went through all of those things. But if I did all of that, I would only get 25,000. I'm heading off the pool, honey. I love you. Oh, I like your sweater. I love you. Have a good night. Do good. Oh shoot, it's Hazel's birthday. All right, one second. It's been all day. Hey, I, I'm playing a game. I'm at work, but tell, is Hazel there? Yeah, here, hold on. Hi, Hazel, I love you. All right, I love you. I have to let you go because I'm working, but a happy birthday, baby. Thank you. All right, bye-bye. All right, sorry, it was her birthday. You got to stop for your nieces and nephews. Okay, so anyway, um. No matter how many things I hit, if my limit is 25,000, that's all I get to pay for all my property damage. This is why as an insurance agent, you need to be educating people that the state minimum is too low. You say, look, this is the minimum of what's required, but the minimum is the minimum. And if you are in an accident and you cause more harm than the money's available on your insurance, that's going to have to come out of your pocket. You can be sued for the remainder of that money. So let's increase your limit. Let's maximize your benefits on your policy so that you don't end up getting sued. So this is why it's important to understand these numbers because you have to explain that to customers. When they say, well, this is what the state told me to get. Yeah, but that's the bare bones minimum. And the, and, uh, the most, I think like the average hospital stay after a car accident is somewhere like 30 to $50,000. 
And, and some states in Arizona, like Arizona is as low as 15, $15,000 per person. And, and still one out of four drivers in Arizona are uninsured. Like it's crazy. <laughs> but like the, the, do you have the per person, total bodily injury, total property damage, all of that is the per occurrence. And that is the limit of liability for accident. So again, you have limit of liability, which is what, what the max the insurer pays. And then what are we talking about? If we say aggregate, then that's the limit of the liability for the total ax, uh, the total policy. If we say per occurrence, that's the limit of liability for each accident. And then if we say per person, that's the limit of liability for each person. Now, per person always gives itself away. They have to put the word person in the question. So if you see a question that says person, like how much money you get for each person, you should be choosing per person. That one always gives itself away in the answer. All right, next one. The individuals whose name appears on the policy's declaration. Name insured, yes. Okay, now you're not wrong for first name insured, okay? But let me let me explain this to you. There's a, there is a difference between name insured and first name insured. And for this definition, the individuals whose name appears on the policy declaration will always be name insured. The only time the answer is first name insured is when they put the word first in there. When, when, the, when the word first is in the question, then you can answer first name insured. The reason, and, and you don't even need to know this technically for the exam, because all you need to know is that first name insured is the name who appears first. First name insured, name appears first. That is first name insured. It's kind of weird, but that's just how it is, okay? Now, first name insured are for commercial policies. This is where a business owns, has an insurance policy, and there has to be a designated spokesperson at the business that the insurance company can talk to. Like if, if the insurer says, we need to talk to somebody at the company about their policy, or we didn't receive a payment this month, who are we going to call? They're going to call first name insured. So first name insured is very unique to commercial policies, okay? But they don't even ask you that. What they ask you about first name insured is whose name appears first, first name insured. It's literally that simple. But this definition, the question that you see on the screen, that will always be name insured. So I know technically first name insured also appears on the declaration, but in order for that to be the answer, you need the word first in there as well. So if it said the individuals whose name appears first on the policy declaration, then blue would be the correct answer. So a little bit tricky, but just, you know, make sure you 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 can, you know, pay attention to that. Any questions on that one? I know it kind of it it's it's easy once you're like, okay, yes, yeah, just first first name insured has to have the word first in it. That one always gives itself away. First name insured has to have the word first in the question. And if it doesn't, you go with name insured. I have a question. Yes, ma'am. Uh, what happens if you have two? Two what? Two names. Two people. That's fine. Names. Like, like, like uh, if you have a husband and a wife, they can both be listed. That's fine. But they're not okay. going to ask you about two names. Okay. They're going to ask you, what is the definition of name insured? The individuals, S, because that could be two, whose name appears on the policy declaration. Okay. With yeah. first name insured, they won't ask about being, they, they'll never ask about two people being on the deck page. They'll just straight up ask you, what is the definition of name insured? The individuals whose name appears on the policy declaration. What is the definition of first name insured? The individuals whose name appears first on the policy declaration. Does okay. that make sense? That makes sense. Thank you. Yep. You're welcome. 
Okay. Um, and then I got a question. Can any name insured cancel or just the first name insured cancel? When it comes to a commercial policy, it, it has to be first name insured. First named is the only person who can make changes on a commercial policy. There has to be a designated person that the insurance company can talk to because they don't want, like, you, let's say you work at a business, let's say you're a grocery checkout at Walmart. Do you know about their insurance or just because you're a name insured, because technically you work there, you're not actually a name insured, but like, would, should you be allowed to call the insurance company and make changes or they call you, hey, you, you work at Walmart, right? We need to talk to you about your policy, right? There has to be someone and it's first name insured. And there's only one when it comes to first name insured. <clears throat> Um, Diana makes sense. I work at a commercial brokerage. So my brain was thinking first name insured. Yes. Cause you're familiar with that. <laughs> that's what you see. That's what you know. Um, uh, but yeah, so in order for the answer to be first, first has to be in the question. All right. Awesome. Let's move on. And again, feel if at any point, another question in your mind comes up though, just, just let me know if, at any point we can answer anything. Unbroken chain of events beginning with negligence and leading to injury or damage. Ooh. <laughs> All right. So um, negligence is the failure to do what a reasonable, prudent person would have done in the same or similar circumstances. And then negligence includes a lot of things. There are, there are elements of negligence. Like how do you prove negligence? And one of the things that you use to prove negligence is proximate cause. But proximate cause has a set definition, which is unbroken chain of events. I want you to think back to the example when we were talking about the fire, we're talking about direct loss. The fire is raging and the fire truck comes along and sprays on the house while the fire is raging. That represents an unbroken chain of events. One thing led to another thing, led to another thing, led to another thing. There was no stop in the events. Fire starts, fire truck comes, sprays the water, puts out the fire, unbroken chain. Okay, so proximate cause means one thing led to another thing, led to another thing. And it's, and it's, the, and it's the result of the first thing, of, of being negligent. When you break the chain, if, if the house fire put, was put out, and a day later, the fire truck comes and sprays water, that would not be covered on your insurance because it, there was a break in the chain. The fire was put out. If they show up a day later and spray your house down, not a covered peril. Your SOL, hopefully that would never, I don't know why that would ever happen, but that should never happen. But that is an example of a broken chain of events. So when we're thinking about negligence, if someone is like, they're going to sue you, they have to prove that what you did was an unbroken chain of events leading to their injury. And if there's any break in the chain between what you did as negligent and their injury, there's no claim there. Like if, if I go to a, a business and they have a rickety staircase and I walk up and down the staircase just fine. But then I make it to my car and I trip over my own shoe. I can't say it was their rickety staircase that was the problem. There's a, there's a break in the chain. I was off the stairs after I got hurt. So proximate cause is an unbroken chain of events beginning with negligence leading to injury or damage. As long as there is a constant connection between the negligence that you're saying the person committed so, so a, a rickety staircase and the injury that I have, twisted ankle, as long as there's an unbroken chain of events through that, then I can say they're negligent. But if there's any break, it's a whole new day, I'm in a whole new parking lot, I'm in a whole new building, the fire was put out a day ago, that is a break in events, okay? So 
Again, let me know if you have any questions and we'll move on. <laughs> policy that pays out for a loss after the primary policy has paid up to its limits. All right, perfect, excess. Okay, so let's talk about the blue one, other insurance. Other insurance is same to same. This is asking primary excess. So other is when I have like two homeowners policies. Let's say my, my husband and I, we both have a house. I get insurance with State Farm. He gets homeowners with Allstate. So in that instance, we have two homeowners policies that's covering the same thing. They're, they're, they're equal policies. One's not primary, one's not excess. They are the same. They're, so that makes them other. I have one and then another one. So other insurance is when it's the same type of policy on the same risk. So like two homeowners, two car insurances, two umbrellas, like it's the same policy on the same risk. Primary is when there is a policy that pays first and then excess, which is also known as secondary pays second. So in that case, that's where you have a homeowners and then you have an umbrella policy on top because your homeowners is limited. Like you can't, the, the, I think the max most insurance companies offer you is like $500,000 for liability. So if your dog bites someone and causes harm or someone gets hurt in your house, or your kid beats someone up on the playground, usually the max you can get on your homeowners is 500,000. If you want more than that, you have to buy a different separate policy known as an umbrella policy. And it rides on top of the home. So where other is home, home, primary is home, excess is umbrella. And primary pays first. So if I do have a claim where my dog bites somebody, and let's say my homeowners has 300,000, the standard liability limit. So my homeowners has 300,000, but the dog bite has caused $600,000 of medical bills, therapy bills, family suing you for missing work, pain and suffering, mental anguish. If, if the, that is $600,000, my home would pay out 300 first because it's primary. And then my excess umbrella, which is secondary, would pay out second. And it would pay the rest of the amount. The minimum of an umbrella is 1 million. So other is same, same, home to home. Primary is homeowners, excess is umbrella. It's a separate policy, a different type of policy that rides on top of the home, not side by side. <clears throat> and, it, and, it, and it can be nicknamed excess. You have primary, and underlying are the two names for the homeowners. It's primary because it pays first. It's underlying because it's under the umbrella. And then the umbrella policy is known as secondary because it pays second. And then it's also known as excess because it pays in excess to the homeowners. Okay, awesome. And let me know, by the way, sometimes like if, if, the, if what I'm saying is making sense, and it feels like you're like, oh my gosh, finally drop an emoji or let me, let me know like, yes, yes. Like finally making sense or something just so that I can make sure my, my explanations are working for you guys and landing. Um, I mean, usually they do, but I just want to make sure. So feel free to drop fire emojis, happy emoji, just so that we, um, you know, I'm making sure that we're on point with what we're learning. Thank you. Kim did a thumbs up. Thank you. <clears throat> All right, next up. All the following are duties after a loss except. This is an except question. Okay, so. It, with an accept question, 
You're answering for the false answer. This is a lot of people get tripped up on this one. You guys did fairly well here. Um, but I even just saw a question in the Facebook group where it was a not question. And she's like, I don't understand. It's saying that this is true. I'm like, yeah, but it's asking for the false answer, not the true answer. <laughs> so an accept question is saying all of the following are true, except this answer. What answer is the false answer? So accept is asking for the wrong answer, basically. <laughs> it's kind of funky and it's not a fair way to test you. I don't know why they make you jump through these hoops to prove that you know these knowledge, but you have to be prepared for accept questions. So it says all the following are duties after a loss. So what, what are your duties? One, you do need to call the police in the event of a theft and hit and run. So like 911 theft, hit and run, okay? Two, you do have to try and protect the property from further damage. If you're in a car accident, you got to move it to the side of the road. If if a, <clears throat> a, if a, a tree branch broke your window, you should board it up. You got to, you got to, as best you can. Like there are times where you have to completely evacuate and completely leave. But <clears throat> if you can, protect it from further damage. And in fact, you get reimbursed for that. So if you do, if you do go by the, the boarded up window, if you protect the property from further damage, you can submit that receipt to the insurance company and they will pay you back for that. Um, you do need to prepare an inventory. If your whole house burned down and you're saying that all these things were stolen or that um, all these things were burned in a fire, what things? What was burned in a fire? How much did you lose? You've got, you've got to prepare an inventory. What you don't do which is the correct answer or the false answer is make cash payments directly to those you hurt. Because even if you did do that, they could still file against your insurance and your insurance would still have to pay them. So just don't ever, don't ever do it. It's a, it's not a good idea. What do we call the risk selection process? Underwriting, yes, underwriting. So risk selection is known as underwriting. And the only time risk selection is the answer is when underwriting is in the question. When they say, what, what is underwriting known as? Then you would choose risk selection. It's the definition of underwriting. But underwriting is what the insurance company does when they're analyzing your risk. So when you say, I would like to get a car insurance policy with you, and they say, what kind of car do you drive? How often do you drive? How long have you been licensed? Have you had any accidents? Do you have any speeding tickets? They are analyzing your risk. They're seeing how risky are you? So underwriting is the risk selection process, figuring out how risky you are and if they're willing to take the transfer of that risk or not. So sometimes you go through underwriting and they decline you because they don't like how risky you are. So the underwriters at the insurance companies are the ones who decide if you can actually get insurance or not. Most underwriting is now done like uh, an algorithm, right? Like you can buy insurance yourself online. They, they're doing the underwriting in the, uh, on a computer system. But for the more tricky uh, cases, they will have actual underwriters. And that's one of the jobs you can get in insurance is being an underwriter. But you, you got to be an, an analysis. You got to look at numbers and charts about risk and factors and all kinds of stuff to be um, an underwriter. I can't see the screen. I thought it was underwriting. I'm on my phone at work. No problem. <laughs> yeah, uh, the, the, uh, the yellow one, underweaving. <laughs> I chose that because I always had a, there was a teacher friend of mine who always talked about underwater basket weaving. And so I threw that in there because I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> it's to yes, it's to make you be aware that the test questions are sneaky, that it makes it look it looks right at first glance, and this is why you got to slow down. You got to slow down as you're you're checking your checking your answers. <laughs> Can you explain the difference between underwriting and exposure? Yes, underwriting is looking at your exposure. So underwriting is analyzing your exposure. Exposure is the risk that you present. 
And underwriting is deciding if the risk that you present is, is okay for them to take on. So exposure would be, because um, I see why you would get that, because I just said underwriting, how many accidents have you had? They're asking you questions about your exposure to then determine if they will underwrite you or not. So if they ask about exposure, they're going to ask questions like um, things that, that determine your risk, like how many accidents you had, what age you are, what driving. When they ask about underwriting, they'll always refer to it as risk selection. So I explained underwriting by describing exposure. So I'm glad you asked this question. This is a great question. So exposure is your things that make you risky or not. Your driving history, your past claims history, um, the kind of car you drive, the neighborhood you live in. Those are your exposure. And then an underwriter analyzes that exposure. They look at, okay, well, she's got this many accidents, this many claims. She lives in this neighborhood that has a lot of theft. Do we want, do we want to take her on? That's what an underwriting is doing. All right, perfect, awesome. And most people don't have exposure on their exam. I'd say about half of you have the word exposure. <clears throat> but underwriting, they will always refer to underwriting as the risk selection process. All right, next one. Insurance carried divided by insurance required times the loss amount equal loss payment. Coinsurance, yes, this is the coinsurance equation. <clears throat> it's it's um and, and it's interesting because it comes in the PC basics chapter and the homeowners. So it's kind of like a double dipper. And and you do need to know the math. Um, but at the same time, you never know if you're gonna get math questions or not. You can get math questions, but there's some people who say I didn't see one math question. There's some people said I saw five math questions. Like you never, it's a mixed bag, right? Because like every time you sit down to take the test, I want you to imagine there's like a cloud above the computer of like 500 questions. And when you sit down, your 100 or however many you take drop down. So every time you take the test, you can have a completely different set of questions. Some of you may take the test and you have exactly the same. Some of you have half the same, half not the same. But you just, you never know, you, you gotta be prepared to see completely different questions. So when it comes to the math, one, you need to be able to identify this equation. You need to know the equation itself and that it means coinsurance. So it's insurance carried divided by insurance required times the loss amount equal loss payment. Then you actually need to be able to solve this. And what coinsurance is saying, and this is, if you were to go to my website, insuranceexamqueen.com, and you click on free resources, and then you click on notes for property and casualty, you will find notes on coinsurance. So you can read more in depth to this because teaching coinsurance takes a lot longer than, than a game night has available for. But ultimately what coinsurance is, is if the insurance company says, we're gonna cover your whole house, and, and, and if the whole house burns down, we need this much money to rebuild it. And you say, well, I don't want to have that much insurance. I just want half of that. They're going to be like, in order to rebuild your house, we need this much money. You're like, but I don't want to carry that much. I want to have less coverage than that. Then they're going to say, well, then we are not going to pay the full amount of claims. They will reduce what they pay you in claims if you're not carrying enough to rebuild the house. And enough to them is 80%. So if they say that your house, we're going to use nice rounded even numbers, that your house is $100,000 to rebuild from the ground up, $100,000, and you say, well, I want to cover 50, you're only covering half the house. You're only carrying enough money to rebuild half a house, but they can't rebuild half a house, right? They can't like, it's, it's completely open. You got to build the rest of the house there, right? So when you say we're not going to cover the full house, then they say, well, we're not going to cover the full claim. 
and they will do the insurance equation to determine how much of the claim they will pay. So we're not gonna learn the math here, but again, I do have examples and go to free resources, um, insurance exam queen. And also it's in my gold series and all my other series, I have videos where I teach you co-insurance. Um, so we have that available for you. And I even have a co-insurance video on YouTube. So you can look that up as well to, to know how to do the math. <clears throat> but being able to identify this equation is important. So they'll do insurance carry divided by insurance required times the loss amount equal loss payment. And you just want to know that that's that equation. I have a question. Uh, okay, sorry, hang on. <laughs> oh, okay, no worry. Sorry. <laughs> the maximum limit of coverage available under a liability policy during a policy year, regardless of the number of claims. Maximum limit. Aggregate, yes, aggregate is maximum. Okay, what was your question? Well, it just occurred to me where you're talking about the uh, co-insurance. So let's say you own a home and the value of your home increases, like the market value goes up. Then you would need to call your insurance agent. If you want to be covered for the full amount, you have to take out more. You have to increase your limit, right? Do you need to be covered for market value? Like if you, you buy a house and it's two hundred thousand dollars, but no, I know what you're saying. Worth. I know what you're saying. Okay. What is the insurance company protecting you for? What you've paid for. What you've paid for, or making repairs. Well, I'm thinking like if it's a total loss, right? Yeah, but what you paid for isn't necessarily what it would cost to rebuild it. Insurance companies only care about the rebuild cost. Okay. okay. Not market value. Right. Okay. So like, for instance, I had a guy in California who wanted a homeowner. He said, I, I got my house for $500,000, half a million dollars, and I need to get insurance on it. And I said, okay, tell me about the house. One bedroom, one bathroom, 900 square feet. Is it okay? Well, we're going to set you up with a, with a policy for a hundred thousand dollars, but I paid five. Yeah, right. you're in California. Yeah. You you bought the neighborhood. You bought the access to the beach. You bought the popularity of your location. Insurance companies don't cover that. Insurance companies rebuild your house if it burns down. So market value doesn't really play a role in your insurance, unless unless. <laughs> your market value is much lower than your replacement. Like if you bought a house, and this is common in Michigan, you buy a house for 15,000, three bedroom, two bathroom house. It's possible you can find them in certain areas, but they would have to insure it for 200,000. They don't like that. They're like, you barely paid for this thing, but we have to cover it for 200, that's not fair. So they write a modified policy called an HOA where they limit coverages. So market value doesn't really play a role when it comes to insurance, unless it's really low, unless it's lower than replacement. But it's almost always way more common to pay more money for your house than it would cost to rebuild it. Because you're paying for the land that it's sitting on. You're paying for the neighborhood that you're in. You're paying for the location. So your mortgage is usually more than what replacement is. Not always, but usually, especially in certain popular areas like California, for instance. Like a, a, a home in California could be sold for a million, same house in Indiana, 150,000, right? It's, it's not about the market value, it's about the, the rebuild value. Now, one thing to consider though with that is the price of wood, the price of the materials to rebuild can go up not necessarily related to market value, but like when COVID happened, everyone was stuck at home. They started making repairs. Everyone's remodeling their home because they're staring. They're like, man, we, we've got time. Let's rebuild this. Let's redo our kitchen. Let's redo all of this. And then the price of materials went up and that can impact you. So one of the things that's available 
as a coverage is guaranteed replacement. And this is a, an endorsement that you can buy on your homeowners. So they're gonna say, we estimate coverage A to rebuild the house from the ground up at 100,000. But there are times when materials can cost more or if everyone in your neighborhood got wiped out, if there was a wildfire and all of you need to rebuild your house, it's gonna be hard to get a contractor to come out there for a reasonable price. They're all gonna be busy, booked out, and their prices are gonna skyrocket. So this is where it becomes an important conversation for you to have with your customers. Say, look, we're not protecting your mortgage. Your mortgage is your mortgage. We're protecting rebuilding the house if it burns down. We estimate it's gonna be $100,000. And that's based on the normal prices of materials. But there are times when the price of materials may skyrocket or go up or inflation simply happens. So we can offer you an extra endorsement that rides on top of your insurance and it will guarantee that we kick in enough money to be able to finish rebuilding your home. Because if, if, they, re, if they have 100,000 to rebuild, but at the end of the day, it's 120, who's, who's paying that other 20? You are. You're gonna have to come out of pocket with that money or you're gonna have to get another mortgage to help you pay that money. And there ain't no mortgage gonna offer you a mortgage on a house that ain't built. So it comes out of your own pocket and the insurance will only pay what they're gonna pay. So by having that guaranteed replacement in there, it helps to protect them and make sure there's more than enough to be able to pay. So kind of on a side tangent, but that is important to know, uh, especially as an, as, as an insurance agent. Does that make sense? Does that answer your question? Yes, perfect, thank you. And perfect, I'm, awesome. I thought it was a tangent. But... Fabulous. Okay. Use when it is difficult to establish the amount of insured property after a loss occurs. Okay, so with this one, uh, oh, you guys all got it wrong, <laughs> except one. Yay for the one. Okay, let's talk about this one. An agreed value is not about it being difficult. In fact, you agree on the value. You know exactly what the value is. So agreed value is when you do a fair valuation. That's the key word for agreed. If it doesn't have fair valuation, it, 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 I'm not saying every single question has fair valuation in it. There's an off chance they ask you kind of something different about agreed. But mostly you're looking for the phrase fair valuation when you're when you're talking about an agreed value policy. Agreed value is when you and the insurer agree that this is the value of the item. And then if if it were to be lost or destroyed, whatever it's covered for, they they pay you what they agreed upon. What this is asking is a valued policy. A valued policy is when you're, the most common example of a valued policy is when you're shipping something in the mail. So if I put something in a box and then I give it to the post office and they lose it, it gets destroyed, somebody runs it over with the truck, it's gone, nobody can look at it. How do they determine the value in that box? They can't, it's gone, it's utterly destroyed. It's impossible to determine the value if the box has gone. If, it, if they lost it, it's gone. They can't look at the contents in the box to determine the value. So when you go to ship something, they'll ask you up front, this is $100 of insurance. Do you need more than that? And then you pick your value. And if they were to lose that box, or if it were to get ran over by a truck and utterly demolished and destroyed, they would just pay you that value. So value is used when in situations where if the item were to be lost or destroyed, you can't analyze it, you can't look at it anymore. So value policies are, are when it's difficult to establish after a loss, like in shipping. Any questions with this one? Okay, 
All right, and I did yes, just, uh, yes, go ahead. Um, so I, I bought the uh, Excel course and the example they give, and, and the answer is stated value. That's why I put stated value is they give the example of fine artwork that's very hard to determine how much is that worth. Right? So that's different. So determine worth is different than establish the loss. <laughs> so stated value is when an item can like fluctuate. Like, like think of a collector's item. Sometimes it's popular, sometimes it's not. Or like <clears throat> just things that can kind of go up or down in, in value. So it's hard to like pinpoint an agreed value, for instance. So you just pick amount that they'll pay up to. And then when you lose that collector's item or it gets lost, destroyed, whatever, whatever you have coverage for, they'll say, okay, what, what are similar items that are currently selling on the market and how much they're selling you for, we'll pay you that. So it's not, it, stated isn't difficult after the loss, stated is difficult to pinpoint the value even right now. Does that make more sense? Yes. That's Clear as mud? It's very close. No, it makes sense. But yeah, there, boy, there, it's a fine line there, it seems to Yeah, me. With, with stated, they don't necessarily have a hard time after the loss occurs. They just have a hard time at a certain point in time. So it's it's when an item fluctuates. It's, it's like collector's items where, where things like, like Beanie Babies, right? There was a time where they were super valuable and then they like lose value. They like They like go up and down. And, and you usually look at agreed and stated together. You either pick an agreed where you do a fair valuation or you do a stated, which is an up to. With stated, when, and also when it comes to the exam, the actual exam, because your course is different from your actual exam. And I always focus on the actual exam, not necessarily your course. Mm -hmm. With stated value, they're looking for the word maximum, the maximum that the insurance will pay after a loss. Because with stated, they'll say, we'll cover this item for up to 300000 And so after the loss occurs, if that item is only selling for $100, they will only give you $100. But if it's selling for $500, they will only give you $300. They'll go up to the stated maximum. Um, what's another phrase? There's another phrase, too. Like agreed, agreed, they sometimes throw in the word, like, Coinsurance doesn't matter when it comes to agreed value because it's whatever they agreed upon. Uh, but with stated, it's usually maximum. So keywords stated maximum, stated maximum, stated maximum. And my gold series, I just uploaded a ton of new videos that go over all of these extensively. So if you haven't gotten gold, definitely check it out. <clears throat> well, I've got your gold. Perfect. Watch, watch through those videos. And again, there's a difference between the pre-licensing course and their practice questions and what you're actually going to see. I always focus on what you're actually going to see. That's why I'm not state approved. Otherwise, I wouldn't be allowed to do that. <laughs> <laughs> but, but the example you just gave sounds like market value because you said, OK, I insured it for up to this amount, but today it's worth less. Market value is what a willing buyer would pay a willing seller. Right. So you gave the and that will, of the Beanie Babies. That's market value, right? Well, Mark, you're not wrong, but when it you don't, there's no such policy that that you buy that's market value. Okay, okay. It's yeah. just a it's just a phrase. Okay. So stated uses market value, yes, but <clears throat> you there's no market value policy. You don't Actually. that doesn't exist. That stated closes. would be the best version of a market value policy. All right. <clears throat> Thank you. Yep. Yep. Replacement cost minus depreciation equals.
All right, good, ACV, ACV, replacement minus depreciation is literally the equation of actual cash value ACV. Now, functional replacement is likely to pop up um, as a question, but um, functional replacement is the modern, less expensive material. So the old, back in the day, houses used to be built with uh, plaster walls, like, like plaster is wet. You had to put wood slats and then you had to slather it with this cement type liquid that would harden. And that's what plaster is. That's how we used to build walls. Now we build wall with drywall. Why it's, that's why it's literally called drywall because it's dry. It's not wet like plaster was. Plaster is so much harder to make. You're dealing with like wet cement trying to make a wall. Drywall, nail, 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 you have a wall. So if your house was built with plaster, you have an older house and it burns down or someone drives through the living room, the insurance company is not going to do plaster. They're going to do drywall. And that's the functional replacement cost. So functional is the modern, less expensive construction material. Oh, and I love the comments, by the way. The new gold videos are everything. Yes. <laughs> and CJ, gold is amazing. Just finish those videos. <laughs> awesome. Yes. I'm talking so much, I'm losing my voice. <laughs> okay. A policy based on fair valuation. Fair valuation. Agreed value, yes. Fair valuation, agreed. We agree on a fair valuation. We agree that it's fair. So agreed is saying, I believe it's worth this much. The insurance company says, I agree that it's also worth this much. We agree on a fair valuation. So fair valuation is saying it's, it's a fair price. We both agree that this is the fair price. And if that item was to be destroyed, in a covered peril, they would simply pay you what they agreed upon. So fair valuation always goes with agreed. Stated maximum, agreed fair valuation. Stated maximum, agreed fair valuation. And market value, this is where we get a little funky. Market value isn't necessarily wrong because agreed value is probably what a willing buyer would pay a willing seller too. But in order for the answer to be market value, it's willing buyer pays a willing seller. Willing, the word willing has to be in market value for that to be the answer. They're very precise on their definitions. And this is why so many people struggle <laughs> because so many things sound the same. Limits of liability, they all sound the same. Um, it, it, it could be a struggle. And that's why I really drill down on specific words that will help you <coughs> key highlight the thing you need to know. A sublimit and a liability policy that puts a ceiling on the payment for all claims that arise from a single incident. per occurrence, per occurrence. So when we're talking about a single incident, that is the same, that's saying per occurrence, each accident, single incident, per accident, per occurrence, same thing. So per occurrence, when we say, when we say a sublimit, we're saying there's an aggregate, which is the max available on the entire policy, but then each each accident only gets a little bit of that. So think of an aggregate as like a piece of pie. And then, I'm sorry, an entire pie. So the aggregate is an entire pizza or, or, a, or an apple pie. And then you cut into it, that is your per occurrence. And then when you break it up into even smaller pieces, that's your bodily injury and your, your property damage. Or another way is think of aggregate as like 
a year. And then your per occurrence is, or, or think of an aggregate as like a day. So one 24 hour day, you get one day. Per occurrence is, is each hour. Uh, bodily injury is each minute. Per person is each second. Like you're breaking it down further and further and further, or like a like a Polish doll. <laughs> you know those dolls where it's like you, it's a big doll, you open it up and then take another doll and then another doll and another doll. That's why limits of liability can be so confusing because it's all the same thing. It's just different limits of, of it. So with per occurrence, it's a sublimit of the aggregate. The aggregate is the total. And then a sublimit of that is how much you get for each accident on the policy. <clears throat> and that's per occurrence. So when you see incident, single incident, or each accident, that is per occurrence. Factor that determines the premium to be charged. Loss valuation, yes. And this is one of the new videos uploaded into Gold 2 where we talk about what loss valuation is. But <clears throat> loss valuation is basically asking what is the value of the loss and how are we going to pay you for it? Are we going to pay you the brand new value known as replacement cost? Are we going to pay you the used value known as actual cash value? How are we going to pay you for that loss? And that's what loss valuation is asking. And that's why it's a factor that determines the premium. Because if they're going to pay you replacement, you're going to have to pay a bigger premium because you're going to get a bigger payout. If they ask, if you say, I'll, I'll take goodwill value, the used value, your premium will be lower because you're going to get less of a payout. So loss valuation is a factor that determines the premium. <clears throat> I might need to get a cough drop here in a minute. My, it's getting intense with my throat. <clears throat> so we are just reviewed this. Yes, good. <laughs> Increase the probability of a loss. What increases the probability of a loss? Hazard, yes. Hazards increase the chance of a loss or increase the probability of a loss. A hazard makes it more likely that it happens. Not that it always happens. You can have a hazard that never leads to a claim and you can have a claim that never had a hazard. But by having hazards, it does make it more likely. So a hazard makes it more likely that you're going to file a claim. Now, Having many hazards is part of exposure, but exposure doesn't automatically increase. If you have very little exposure, that's not increasing. So exposure doesn't mean automatically that you are bad. Exposure is simply asking how much exposure do you have? If you have a lot of exposure, then you, you could be hazardous, <clears throat> but exposure itself doesn't mean increase. Um, hazard increases. Hazards increase. You need to know the definition of hazard. A hazard increases the chance of a loss. And then you need to know the three types, physical, moral, and morale. <clears throat> and we'll probably see those questions come up soon. Individuals are businesses that are not named as insurance on the deck page, but are protected by the policy. Additional insurers. Hi, this is Drea. If y'all could um. All right. 
Um, additional insureds, yes, additional insureds. So additional <laughs> insureds are businesses like a um, uh, lien holder or a mortgage protection company. So if they are the ones <clears throat> that are covering your policy, they're, I mean, they're, they're the ones that you have a loan with, they want to be protected on your policy as well. So they get added via endorsement to the, to the policy. And so additional insurance are added via endorsement in regard to a specific interest like a loan, okay? Um, uninsured is simply someone who is covered by the policy. So they also are not named on the declaration page and they are technically protected by the policy, but when we define an insured, we simply say someone protected by the policy. We don't emphasize that they're not named. We do emphasize that additional insureds are not named. Additional insureds are added via endorsement and they're on there. <clears throat> yes, um, there was someone making another noise and I think I missed it as Drea, but let me fix that, hang on. Yeah, there was um, somebody, and maybe you were just gonna say that, but I think I fixed it, Drea. Uh, I just had a quick question. I was gonna say, um, can we not say the answer out loud? That way yes. for us who's <laughs> trying to figure out the answer, you know what I mean? Yes, exactly. I, I didn't want and that's to why be I, rude when I said that, but I was just like, I, I haven't even read the question fully before I answered. Yes, no problem. And honestly, I, I as soon as I went to go, mute whoever that was you were the only one as unmuted which is why i muted you oh as soon as they answered whoever that was that said the answer i wanted to be like no like please stop because i wanted yes. to finish reading the options so yes. we could just not answer out loud please yes definitely and everyone is showing as muted so don't unmute yourself to share an answer and if and if i we hear it again i'll say it like we can hear you double check your, your mute because we do want everyone to have the opportunity to read it without someone else sharing the answer. So just double check that. And some, some people are unaware that they're un, unmuted, which is why I check the list every so often. Um, I can also force mute all of you, but I don't like that because I want you to be able to ask a question. What's up, PJ? Uh, <laughs> how'd you know? Uh... Yeah, just asking for your help on this, because again, going through the Excel material for Texas, that's why I put A, or the red answer, uh, because the questions I've seen in their material led me to pick that answer. I, so it's a little ambiguous there. So it's yes, and, it, and yeah, and that's again, <clears throat> pre-licensing versus what you, because it, the way they word things isn't always, and that's why we struggle with our pre-licensing courses so badly. And I know I've partnered with Excel, but that's because I love their practice exam. But um, an insured is someone who is simply insured. Um, and, and that could be anybody. Like if, if I crash my car into you, you you've now become an insured right. and you are covered. But the when we define insured, we're saying anyone covered by the policy. And in fact, the state exam hardly, if ever, asks about the definition of an insured. They, they focus on name insured and additional insured. Those are probably the two most common questions when we look at <clears throat> all these possibilities. But with uh, additional insured, and, and you're likely to see additional insured added via endorsement in regard to a specific interest too. Like, honestly, I may have, cut that part out because you only get so much space. But an additional insured is someone added in regard to a specific interest because they have a loan out for you. So they are they are not on the deck. So you do want to know additional is not on the deck page. That is very important. So they're not on the deck page, but they are protected by the policy because they are added via endorsement. Yeah, if you if that had been in there, I would have gotten the answer. Yeah, perfect. Endorsed. Yeah, so at least you know that. As long as you know that, you're you're good. Thank you. Yep. <clears throat> Staying at a hotel after a first is a fire. After a fire, sorry. <laughs> Yeah. 
Indirect loss, yes. So indirect is everything that happens after the moment of danger. So fire is put out. What now? Now I have to stay at a hotel because my house has burned down. So that's the indirect loss, the consequences to the direct loss. Hotel is the most common example of an indirect loss, having to stay at a hotel and or loss of profits if you're looking at commercial insurance. But for homeowners, they almost always talk about indirect as staying at a hotel. The house burned down, I have to stay at a hotel. <clears throat> and that is an indirect loss. <clears throat> Physical damage to either people and or property. Ooh, <laughs> this one is um, just physical damage. <laughs> a direct loss isn't always physical. Um, direct loss is more about, I mean, it is weird because this one is kind of tricky, but there is like PD is physical damage. Like when you have like your split limits, you have per person, bodily injury, PD. PD is the physical damage. So you need to know that physical damage is the damage to the physical property. But a direct loss may not necessarily be physical. Um, not all direct losses are physical losses, is, is maybe a way to say that. It's not to say a physical damage is a is 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 a type of direct loss, right? So it's like a kind of like a peel the layers back on the onion <laughs> where Physical damage is a direct loss, right? But not every direct loss is physical damage. So this one is the one where they give it away. Some, some questions always give themselves away. Physical damage to either people or property is simply physical damage. It, it's almost too easy. And that's why sometimes we get tricky with that one. Okay. Yep. So... I thought you said, maybe you misspoke, but I thought you said physical damage is physical damage. Yes. So, so that would have been blue, the blue answer. Wait, isn't that the right answer? Uh, you said it was direct loss. No, no, no. <clears throat> people chose direct loss. More, I, more, <clears throat> more people picked direct loss than physical damage. So that's why I was addressing I thought it. that was. Oh, I chose physical damage and it said I was wrong. Yeah. Yeah, same thing for Did me. Did I mess up? Can we go back one? <laughs> I yeah, can't. I, I can't wrong, go back. I, I already did that. <laughs> <laughs> Julie, I'm sorry. Yes, that dude, one it's uh, showing direct, direct loss. loss. Direct loss is direct. Yeah, you. Okay, sorry. So it might have been my bad. I, I might have missed. Okay, direct loss. How do they define direct loss? Well, direct loss is. I, I I always have brain farts every once in a while, and also pregnancy. <laughs> oh, uh, but physical damage is PD, but they don't actually ask about it. Let me see how we define direct loss. Yeah, okay, sorry. That is direct loss. So direct loss is direct physical damage to a building or property. So my bad, my bad. It is direct oh. loss. And if you chose direct loss, you were correct. No. Oh. And then direct losses also include proximate cause of loss. So my bad. But PD, they don't really ask the definition of PD. But PD is just physical damage. It, like, what is PD? What is, what is the abbreviation of PD physical damage? And that also is the same definition, really. But they don't ask about it. They really only ask about direct loss. So my bad on that one. I'm glad we caught it. Thank you. I'm more confused. Then 10 seconds ago. Can we okay? So it's break? direct loss is direct physical damage to building or property. Okay. And that's just another way of and, and that like physical that is physical damage to PD. Like when you have when you have your car insurance 25, 50, 25, 
the last number is physical damage, PD. But they don't really quiz you on the, what does that mean? Does that make more sense? Mm -hmm. Okay, <laughs> sorry about that guys, sorry, sorry, my bad. Okay. The individuals who name appears first, first on the declaration page. First name insured, exactly. First name insured, first name insured, exactly, exactly. You've got to have the word first in there for the answer to be first. List the duties and rules of both parties. Conditions, yes. Conditions are rules, duties. Obligations, ways of behaving. That's how you know the answer is conditions. When they've got the word duty, rules, obligations, or ways of behaving, it is conditions. And policies are conditional. In order for us to cover the claim, you have to give us a list of what was damaged. You, If you want me to do this, you got to do that. That's the conditions, which are the duties and rules of both parties. Does somebody have a question? Okay, T, you're you're uh, not muted. If you want to double check that, yeah. my bad. <laughs> no Sorry, problem. no problem. I think it was just a little bit of an echo there. A parent is responsible for their child. Vicarious liability, yes. Parents have vicarious liability. Vicarious is an old English law, which is possible to show up on your exam, an old English law. They literally use that phrase um, where it says the master is liable for the acts of the servant or the master is responsible for the acts of the servant. In the modern world, it's parent over child and employer over employee. And those are the two examples. They, they really love to focus on the parent one though. So a parent is responsible for their child. Anything the child does, we can sue the parent for because the parent is more likely to have money and the parent has vicarious liability. My daughter always asks me, so this is my first pregnancy, but I do have an adopted daughter. And she goes, when I turned 18, you stopped being so mean. <laughs> I said, because I'm no longer vicariously responsible for you. You're all, you're, it's all you now. Everything you do falls on you. If you want to mess up, you mess up. But before that, it was on me because I understand vicarious liability. So vicarious liability, the parent is responsible for their child. The employer is responsible for their employee. A transfer of legal rights and ownership of the policy. An assignment, yes. So an assignment, I am, I am assigning it to you. So I assign this to you, like I assign you homework, I'm transferring this responsibility to you. So when you're transferring a policy to another person, you're assigning it to them. Great job. The replacement cost method of loss valuation.
Pause to buy brand new. Yes. So, and, and they love to use the word today, by the way, brand new today, because insurance companies are paying you today. So they're looking at today's prices. So replacement cost is the brand new value today. What would it cost me to walk into a store and buy it brand new out of the box or in the box? Sorry, that's replacement cost. So brand new at today's prices. And we never care about the original price. We do, and this is where it could be tricky. Irene had a question like this the other day. It said, somebody bought a ta an antique table five years ago for $4,000. Today, the table is at a replacement of $6,000 and it has a, and it has depreciated $200 every year. So she was like, well, it doesn't matter what they paid five years ago, right? And I'm like, right, but it matters that it's five years old because we have to subtract the depreciation for it. So the one number you don't care about is the purchase price. But if they're asking you to actually do replacement costs minus depreciation, you do have to solve for depreciation five years. So in her example, it was the table depreciated $200 every year. 200 plus 200 plus 200 plus 200 plus 200, $200 every single year was $1,000. So even though they originally bought the table for 4,000, the current replacement was 6,000 minus, 1,000 depreciation still gave them $5,000. So they actually got more than what they paid, which is sometimes confusing when you think actual cash value, but some things do go up in value. So even though you have the used value, you sometimes being used makes it more valuable depending on what it is, an antique or something like that. But replacement is the cost to buy it brand new today. What are today's prices? I don't care what you paid 10 years ago. What is it going to cost me today to buy that item today? That's replacement cost. A property insurance clause that extends broader coverage to current policies, no premium increase. I got to move my screen. Liberalization. Yes. So this is where an insurance company wants to add something to the policy. They want to add something extra um, or make a change to their overall coverage. Uh, but you already have a policy. Like they legally can't change it while you bought it. Once you bought it, it kind of locks it in. But there is one example where they can change it. And that's where they, um, as long as they make it better than what it was before and don't charge you for it, they're allowed to do it. So when it say extends broader coverage, they're making it better. So it, they're only allowed to change your policy if they make it better and don't make you pay more. And that is liberalization. So liberal means more freedom, better. So liberalization, when you have, when you're going to give me better coverage for free, you can make that change in my policy without my permission. That's liberalization. If a person recognizes and understands that there is danger involved in an activity and voluntarily chooses to do it. Assumption of risk. Okay, so I could see why you could choose contributory, but contributory is more like you contributed to the, the, the problem. Assumption of risk is saying that you walked into a baseball game where balls get thrown around. It's not saying that you are part of the problem. Contributory says you're part of the problem. You're the reason that something happened. Assumption of risk is saying, 
<clears throat> you walked into a, a thing that is inherently dangerous, like a baseball. There literally was a court case where someone sued a baseball team for being hit in the head. And they're like, bro, you chose to go into a stadium where you know balls are flying. You chose to potentially get hit in the head with a baseball. So you can't actually sue a baseball team when you get hit by a baseball because you assumption of risk. <clears throat> Whenever you go to like, when you go bungee jumping or you do, you do something crazy like that, you have to sign a waiver. The waiver is an assumption of risk. You're saying that you assume the risk and you, you won't hold the company responsible. And contributory is contributing to the problem, which is different than, than doing, than just engaging in an activity that has danger to it. Okay. Can you give an example? Of contributory? Uh, yeah. So contributory would be um, you're at fault for the situation that, that you're in. Like if you went to a grocery store and you had a cup of water with no lid and you're walking around and you spill it and then you slip on the floor, can you sue the grocery store for having a wet floor when you're the one who spilled the water on it? No, you contributed towards the problem. But they won't ask you about that. They'll ask you about the definition. And the definition of contributory would be if you if you are in any way responsible, if you in any way contributed to the negligence, you can't go after the other party. You can't sue them at all. And, and most places are not contributory. Most states are um, comparative where they'll say, okay, well, you're 50% at fault and you're 50% at fault. You pay 50% of the bill and you pay 50% of the bill. Contributory says if you are 1% at fault, you could get nothing from the other person. <clears throat> Chat box, hot imagine. Oh, okay, weird question. Um, yeah. So when you work for someplace and you assume the risk, I know there's a negligence for that, is there? Like, I remember it being somewhere in my reading, but like, say you work, you work as like a baseball player, you assume the risk of being a baseball player. Is there a negligence for that? Um, so usually when they talk about assumption of risk and they're talking about your job, they're, they're in the work, you're in the workers comp section and in workers comp assumption of risk used to be something that employers could hold against you. They say, well, you chose a dangerous job, but now ultimately they have to offer workers comp anyway. So assumption of risk is kind of not really used anymore at your job. When they talk about assumption of risk in the workers comp section, they're referring to defenses that companies used to have, but now they don't need defenses anymore because it, we just cover you through workers comp. Oh, okay. Okay. Memory trick. P for comparative to remember percentage. Yes, uh, Delilah, thank you. So look in the comments. She said memory trick for comparative. P, you each pay the percent of your responsibility. Contribute is you contributed, you get nothing. If, if you caused, if you're 1% guilty, you get nothing from the other party. All right. An insured structure in which no people have been living or working and no property has been stored. Vacancy. So vacancy is no people, no stuff. Vacant, no people, no stuff. Unoccupied is no people, but there is stuff. So unoccupied is most common when you go on vacation. Like I just went camping. I didn't take my, my whole house with me. 
I took, I took a suitcase of clothes, right? So unoccupied, I still left my stuff here, but I left. So unoccupancy is where I went on vacation. Vacancy is where I took everything out and I left. No people, no stuff. A material or structural issue that increases the chance of a loss. Physical hazard, yes. So material and structural is a physical hazard and it increases the chance that you have a loss. Lying on purpose. Moral hazard, yes. So moral, you're lying on purpose. Moral is I know what I'm doing wrong and I, and I choose to do it anyway. So moral is doing something wrong, knowing you're doing something wrong and still just doing it. What type of policy will cover anything not excluded? Oh, what just happened? Sorry, I lost, I lost a second there. All right, are you guys still there? I had a thing that popped up as on my internet. Okay, I see you all on video. Okay, yeah, we're all right. <laughs> I was like, oh no, there's been a time where my whole internet just went and just lost everything. And I was like, oh my God. <laughs> All right, you guys are still there. Good. All right, open peril. Yes, open peril covers everything not excluded. So there's always exclusions. Even named peril has exclusions. But the thing with open is they'll say, we are open to everything except what's excluded. Name peril says it's got to be names to be covered. It still has exclusions. Every, every policy has exclusions, but name peril says it must be named to be covered. If it ain't named, it ain't covered. Exactly. If it ain't named, it ain't covered. Open peril, we cover everything not excluded. A property insurance policy that covers a certain kind of unit or property for a set amount of insurance. Specific, yes. So this is the difference between blanket and specific. Blanket, um, so let's let's try to look at an example. Let's say I have a table of jewelry. So I've got a ring and a necklace um, and a bracelet. Blanket would say, I'm going to take a blanket of $5,000 and cover all of this jewelry. If just one of the things were to be stolen, I could claim up to 5,000. But if all three were stolen, I would still only be able to claim up to 5,000. That's what a blanket is. It's one amount of money that will cover all of the things for one amount of money. Specific will say the ring is covered for 5,000, the necklace is covered for 2,000, and the bracelet is covered for 3,000. Everything will get its own amount 
of money for it, <clears throat> okay? Blanket is one policy covering multiple classes. So when I say one policy covering multiple pieces of jewelry, but blanket is more common, like um, if, if you own a bunch of, bunch of little like coffee stands and you've got one on this side of town, one on that side of town, one on that side of town, you have a blanket policy that covers all of them under one policy because it's, it's hard, it's rare that all three of them would like burn down on the same day. Um, so a blanket policy is multiple things, uh, a single policy covering multiple classes. Specific is each thing gets its own amount of money. <laughs> uh, right now in Michigan, the power keeps going out. Oh, I'm so sorry. Um, I'm actually gonna be in Michigan soon. Uh, my mom lives in Michigan. <clears throat> sorry that the power is going out. You will get a copy of the recording. The amount of money realized from the sale of damaged merchandise. Salvage, yes, the salvaged value is um, the broken value. So if they total your car, that your insurance company owns your broken car, they can sell it to a junkyard for parts and they get to keep that money. Certain rules must be met by both parties. Conditional, yes, rules, duties, obligations, ways of behaving, conditions. Pretty much anytime you see the word rule, condition should be your answer. Rule, condition, rule, condition. Uh, duties, obligation, ways of behaving, all um, conditional. So um, someone said, can you explain adhesion versus aleatory? And yes, I actually just made a YouTube video on that too. Adhesion says that the insurance company has to stick to what they said. So they say, we will cover you for X, Y, Z. They have to cover you for X, Y, Z. Adhesion also says, if you're gonna buy the policy, you have to buy all of it. You can't pick and choose the parts that you want because they're, even if you can add and remove coverages, there's still like a base policy and it's typed up. Declaration, definitions, uh, insuring agreement, conditions, whatever. You can't say, well, I want this paragraph, but not that paragraph. That's what we're saying when with, with adhesion, when we say if the customer wants, wants it, they have to take all of it. Like I like to think of adhesion as that fly tape. You know how it's like sticky on both sides so that flies get stuck to it? The insurer has to stick to what they said and you have to stick to the whole policy. You can't pick and choose different parts that you want. Aleatory or aleatory is an unequal exchange. Teeny tiny premium for big claim payout. So I pay $28 a month for my life insurance. If I pay that for one month and then I die, $250,000 pays out. $28, 250000 quarter of a million dollars pays out, okay? So that's aleatory, aleatory. And you can watch the YouTube video um, a few times to get it. And I also go into unilateral too in that same video. <laughs> and unilateral is a one-sided promise. The insurance company is promising that if you have a valid claim, they will pay it. And if they don't pay it, you can sue them. So unilateral is a one-sided promise and only one side is legally obligated to do anything. And it's the insurer is obligated to pay that valid claim. So uh, check out that YouTube. It's one of the newest uh, YouTube videos on there. Is that also in the gold package? No, because well, I mean, I do explain them in the gold, yes. But, okay. but I just put up like a seven minute YouTube video on the difference of aleatory adhesion and unilateral because everyone confuses those all the time. 
The focus for adhesion is take it or leave it, that the um, customer has to take all of it or none of it, and that the insurer has to cover you for what they said they would cover you for. Unilateral will always focus on one-sided promise and legally bound. And aleatory will always focus on an unequal exchange. It's, it never balances. It's always unequal. The injured party must be completely free at fault in order to collect. Contributory, free of fault. Comparative says I, you can be guilty, but you'll, you'll pay for your level of guilt and they'll pay for their level of guilt. You split it based on a percentage of fault. Contribute says if you're in any way guilty, you can't, you can't collect, you can't sue the other person. So even if, even if it's like 99% your fault. So let's say I'm walking down and this isn't necessarily maybe the best example because dogs and animals are absolute liability, but just for the sake of understanding here, let's say contributory negligence. I'm walking down the, the sidewalk and I step into your yard a little bit because maybe the, maybe the sidewalk is broken or it's wet and I wanna avoid it. So I step into your yard and then your dog comes and, and bites me it's technically I went into your yard. Like maybe your dog is on one of those like invisible leashes, you know, like they can't go past a certain space. You say, well, I am at fault, but it's also your fault for having your dog. Like who's the guilty party here? And if, and if any person, if both are guilty to some extent, I am guilty for stepping into your yard, then I can't sue you. But that, but is it, that's not necessarily the best example because for the state exam, you want to think of animals as absolute liability. And if your dog bit someone, you're absolutely responsible. But to help explain contributory negligence as an example like that. But this, this is what you'll see when they ask about contributory is that you have to be completely free at fault to sue the other person. You must be totally innocent. Comparative says you can be guilty and you pay for your part and I'll pay for my part. Contribute says if you contributed in any way to the problem, you cannot collect. Is there a certain time this is over? Yeah, so technically 8.15, um, but as long as my, I'm, I, we do have 30 questions left. So I was going to see how long I could go, <laughs> but um, you, could, you could check out at any point you need to check out. I might go until my voice is like, you're done, lady. <laughs> so I was just going to keep going until I could go. <clears throat> hey, Melissa, can I ask a question about the yes. previous one with um, um, adhesion? Uh -huh. And forgive me, if because I know you said earlier, well, you teach to the test. so It's important to clear it up. Go ahead. So again, in the Excel material, the examples they give, like the practice tests I've been taking, when they talk about adhesion, they say it's when, if the wording in the contract is ambiguous in any way, then they will find in favor of the insured yep. versus the insured. That's how they define, or that's yes. the example they and, give. And I'm not saying anything different when I say they have to stick to what they said. Yeah. So if they said in the contract that they're gonna cover you, then they have to cover you. Now, ambiguity, they usually will test ambiguity as a separate concept, and it doesn't show up for everybody, so I don't always address it. But ambiguity is, um, and this is true, that if the insurance company, and another way that they may test adhesion is that the insurer is the one who wrote the contract. Like, they wrote it. Like, the insured, the customer has no say over what was written in the contract. So that's another way they talk about adhesion. But with adhesion, they have to stick to what they said. And if what they said is confusing or unclear in any way, and a judge agrees that it is confusing or unclear, 
then a judge can make them pay the claim. But usually they separate that and test that as ambiguity or ambiguous, and they test on adhesion as, as a stick to what they said and or take it or leave it. Okay, because take it or leave it to me sounds like unilateral. Like the insurance company writes the contract and you either agree to it or you don't. Like to me that, to me that's take it or leave it. Well, yeah, take it or leave it. You got to take, take all of it or none of it. Yeah. Like, like when you get married, you're married to that entire person. You have, you take all of them or none of them. Like you, yeah. you get the whole shebang. <laughs> um, unilateral will always focus on a one sided promise and uni means one. So one sided promise and and like you can sue them for not paying a claim, but they can't sue you if you don't pay your premium. If you don't pay your premium, there's nothing the unless you lie, unless you outright commit fraud, they can't sue you because you fail to pay your premium. You're not making a promise to the insurer. They are the ones promising you that they will pay if there's a claim. Does that make more sense? Yeah, but uh, it still seems to me that take it or leave it would be more to me in my mind. I, I, I could be, but that's. Well, then go take it or leave it is not what I think. Take yeah. it or leave it is the other one. Like you literally <laughs> just got to create a pattern for yourself because it's okay. the same thing with like um, uh, bodily injury. You have special and general. Special is exact medical bills. General is mental pain and anguish. It's literally the opposite of what you would think. And I literally just, just say, remember it as the opposite. It's the opposite of what you would think. You would think a medical bill is a general bodily injury and special would be pain and suffering, but it's the opposite. So just, just tell yourself, make a new memory that says, take it or leave it is not what I think. It's the other one. Like you, you got to, Make a cartwheel in your head. <laughs> All right, thank you. Yep. <laughs> Reduces recovery to an injured person if blank interrupted the chain of events. intervening cause. <laughs> so this is like when you, and this is the most common example they use for intervening cause. It snowed, you scooped the snow, you shoveled the snow off the sidewalk, and then it snowed again and someone tripped on the, or fell on the ice or whatever from the snow. You get to say, well, I did do it, but it snowed in the middle of the evening or in the middle of the night, I couldn't go out and shovel it again. So intervening cause is like, you tried to prevent, you tried to reduce, but something happened in between that you couldn't make up for. And that's intervening cause. Also known as consequential losses. Indirect loss, you have indirect the consequences, the consequences to the loss. So the consequence of the house burning down is now I have to stay at a hotel. The consequence of a pipe bursting in my business, now I am losing out on profits. So the indirect is the consequence to whatever happened. So indirect consequence, indirect consequence, indirect consequence. Proximate, direct, proximate, direct, proximate, direct. Proximate cause is a part of direct loss. Consequence, indirect is the consequence. And I know they seem similar, 
because wet walls are a consequence of a fire. I get it, but they they put proximate under direct because it's next to, it's nearby, it's part of the fire. Consequences are after, after the fire is put out, then what happens? The other party's negligence or fault will not necessarily defeat the claim. I can still sue. Comparative. So comparative says I'm guilty, but it won't necessarily mean that I can't sue you. Contribute says if you're in any way at fault, the claim is defeated. <clears throat> you can't you can't fight it. Comparative says I'm I'm my level of guilt. You're your level of guilt. I can still sue you for your level of guilt. And only half of you are tested on this. So um I don't, I can't, I don't mean, it's not like I have the states at the top of my head, but not everyone's actually tested on this. New York, Pennsylvania, the ones I've seen, New York, Virginia, South Carolina, um, those, that, that will show up for you guys, but Texas, uh, Georgia, Florida, not likely, New York, this will show up. Single property covering multiple classes. Single property covering multiple classes. Blanket, yes. So blanket is a single property policy covering multiple classes. You get one amount of money for all the stuff under the blanket. Modern, less expensive building materials. Functional replacement. Yep, this is like the plaster walls. We use drywall now. Drywall is the modern, less expensive building materials. They won't rebuild your house with plaster. Sorry, what was the answer to the last one? I was writing it down. Functional replacement. Thank you. Modern, less expensive materials. Limits of liability, yes. So limits of liability is what they will pay for that thing, whatever we're talking about. The whole policy has a limit of liability. Each accident has a limit of liability. Each person has a limit of liability. But it's whatever is stated for that thing, that's the limit of liability. Earth movement and water damage are... Excluded, yes. These are the two major exclusions um, on a policy. Now, some of you chose additional coverage. You can get endorsements for these, but endorsements are extra money. Additional is not. So additional coverage doesn't cost you additional money. I hate that they use the word additional. I'm sorry, but that's the way they word it. Additional coverage is coverage that's built in. It's kind of like the side dishes to your main meal. If we're looking at a homeowner's, you have coverage A, B, C, D, main meal, additional coverages um, <clears throat> like laundry, shrubs, and plants. It's the side dish. It's not the main coverage. You don't pay extra for those. 
earth movement and water damage are excluded, you would have to buy an endorsement in order for them to be covered. And those endorsements are gonna cost you extra money. Automatically at fault for doing something dangerous. Absolute liability. Yeah, I like to say that absolute liability is Joe Exotic because he did things like explosives and pet tigers and swimming pools and all of those things. You're absolutely at fault. Digging a hole in the ground and filling it with water is dangerous for humans because we can drown. We don't, we can fall in it. So swimming pools, pet tigers, explosives are all absolute liability. And we don't have to prove that what you did is negligent. You are automatically at fault because it's absolutely dangerous. A dollar amount an insured must pay on a claim before the insurance policy provides coverage. Deductible, yes. The deductible is what we pay first, and then the insurer kicks in to pay the rest. A property is insured against fire. What is fire considered? Peril, yes. Fire is a peril. An additional amount of coverage on the policy at no additional premium. Supplementary, yes. So supplementary, so additional, <laughs> additional and supplementary is like, the same tomato, tomato. Sometimes they call it additional. Sometimes they call it supplementary. So it's supplementary it's slash additional, additional slash supplementary, same, same. But both are the side dishes. They're not A, B, C, D, but they're covered by the policy with no additional premium. The cost to buy something new at today's prices. Replacement, brand new today's prices. New today. Replacement is new today. Now, market value is not necessarily not this definition, but you have to see willing buyer, willing seller. The word willing has to be in the answer for market value. So market value is what a willing buyer would pay a willing seller. Replacement is walking into a store and buying it brand new. We don't really think of like, when you think of market value, you don't, you don't go into a store to buy a house. You buy it from another person. So market value is, is buyer and seller. Replacement cost is brand new at the store at today's prices. That might help separate that idea for you. But you've got to see the word willing for the answer to be market value. If you don't see the word willing, it's not market value. Incurred losses plus adjusting expenses divided by earned premium. Loss ratio, yes. 
So loss ratio is, you, and this one, luckily you don't have to do the math. This one, you only have to identify. So it's, it, and, and this is basically solving for, um, basically is the insurance company making money or not? Are they collecting enough money to pay the claims and then even more money on top of that? Um, and that's the loss ratio. So you simply wanna memorize this equation as loss ratio, but you don't need to worry about actually doing the math. Protects the interests of the mortgage company. Mortgagee rights, yes. So mortgagee rights, um, as a mortgage company, they own the house like you do, and they are protected by the policy when they're an additional insured, and they have their own rights. They can actually file a claim in their own name, um, and nothing can defeat their position. Like even if you as an insured mess up, they still get to make a claim in their own name. So mortgagee rights protects the interest of the mortgage company. Provides a sharing of a loss with other insurance that may be written on the same risk. Pro rata. So pro rata, so this would be an example of um, other insurance, homeowners to homeowners. And then how, if, if we go back to that example, we talked about other insurance. We said the wife has state farm, the husband has all state on the same house. Pro rata is asking how much will each company pay? And you do the pro rata equation to determine that. And you do need to know that math. And I, I'm pretty sure I have a YouTube video and an, a more extensive video in um, the class series. But pro rata is, how are we gonna share the cost of the loss? A policy based on the max amount of money the insurer will pay in the event of a loss. Stated value, max, max, maximum stated, stated maximum, stated maximum, stated maximum. Um, replacement cost is not a policy. It's a loss valuation inside of a policy. So this says a policy based on stated value is a type of policy. Agreed value is a type of policy. <clears throat> replacement cost, not a type of policy. Market value, not a type of policy. Contains the insurer's promise to pay. Insuring clause. So contains the insurer's promise to pay. The word rule, the word duty, the word obligation is not in this question. So conditions is not the answer. Conditions has to be rule, duty, obligation, or ways of behaving. Promise to pay is actually a part of two answers. Insuring clause being one of them. And then also you probably chose conditions because you were thinking consideration. Consideration 
<clears throat> is that both parties must bring value to the other party. And when we say, well, what value does the insurer bring? It's the promise to pay. So if you chose conditions because you were thinking consideration, you need to write out conditions and consideration and write out their definitions and get them separated in your mind because they are two different things. Um, but condition, so consideration says the value that the insurance company brings is the promise to pay. But consideration is not where we find that promise. Consideration simply says they made a promise. In order to read and understand what that promise is, you have to go to the insuring, insuring agreement to read that promise. So conditions says, I'm sorry, <laughs> consideration says the insurance company is promising that they will pay a claim. That is the value that the insurance company is giving you. But to read that promise, to see what that promise actually is, we have to go to the insuring clause, the insuring agreement. Sometimes they say insuring clause, Sometimes they say insuring agreement. But remember, conditions has to be rules, duties, obligations, ways of behaving, and make sure, and that probably is going to be my next YouTube video, separating conditions from consideration, because they are two different things. Liability for products. Strict liability, yes. So liability for products, um, strict liability is strictly about a product. So like a manufacturer of a company, if they make something and then it explodes in people's hands or it causes problems, they have strict liability. They have to have insurance for that. So strict liability is strictly about a product, a manufacturer. And that product being sold and shipped to other people and that product has something wrong with it and it hurts the customer, strict liability. What type of policy lists the perils insured against? Named, yeah, and named will list it. Fire, lightning, wind, hail. So a name peril policy will list out the perils that you have coverage for. And the phrase insured against means you're covered for this. But instead of saying you're covered for this, they say you're insured against it. Printed addendums to the contract are. Endorsements, yes. Yeah. So endorsements are um, changes, printed addendums. Endorsements say all changes have to be written, which is printed, written, written, printed, written. So, and then addendum is adding. So an endorsement is adding something to the policy. Now, not every endorsement costs money, like adding your lien holder, your mortgage company to your insurance, stapling on the back, that doesn't cost you money, but endorsements like earth movement and water damage, water sewer backup, that is going to cost you money. Most state exams will refer to endorsements as costing extra money. Just wanted to point that out. But printed addendums, written changes, those are endorsements. Old English law that says the master is responsible for the acts of the servant.
<clears throat> vicarious, vicarious liability. Parent is responsible for the child. Employer is responsible for the employee. Termination of a policy during the term is. Cancellation, yes. So you have cancellation and you have non-renewal. Non-renewal will probably come up here in a second. But cancellation says you have a policy that is good for six months between this date and this date. Cancellation is ending it somewhere in between this date and this date. So it's a termination of a policy during the term, during the time that it is active, you're canceling it somewhere in between the effective dates. That is cancellation. Let's smoke and drink because we will die someday anyway is what type of hazard? Morale, yes. <clears throat> Morale um, is a sense of carelessness. Like who cares? We're all gonna die. Smoke and drink eat your hot dog, do whatever, we're all gonna die. That's a carelessness, that is a morale hazard. It involves ale, drinking, oh my God, yes! That is one of the best examples. I can't believe I've missed that before. So moral has no little e, and that's lying on purpose. Morale is drinking, a sense of carelessness. Whatever, man, I'm just having a good time, YOLO. That's a morale hazard. That is the best example. I'm going to use that forever now. Thank you, Amen. That is amazing. Failure to do what a reasonable, prudent person would have done in the same or similar circumstances. Negligence, yes. <clears throat> so negligence, the failure to do what a reasonable, prudent person would have done under the same or similar circumstances. Contains all the basic underwriting info like name, address, premium, etc. Declarations, yep. The declaration page has the nap. Name, name, address, amount, premium, property description. Uh, all the basic stuff. And they even say basic underwriting info when they talk about declarations. Insurable risk must exist between all the following except. May exist. Does exist. Friends, yes. So you have insurable risk with your spouse. You are financially connected in your considered family. Um, spouses aren't technically blood, but you you think when you think of when you think of insurable interest, you want to think blood, business, or money. Spouses are, are blood. And that they like especially that children, their children become blood to both of them. Okay. Um, predator and debtor. You, if you have a loan and then I die, my loan doesn't get paid off. The bank does have insurable interest on me. They need me alive to pay the loan. So there is insurable interest between a creditor and a debtor. That, that's just saying you, you, owe, you owe money to someone. You have a loan with someone. Business partners, you have risk together. You have financial entanglement, blood, business, or money for insurable risk. Who you don't have insurable risk with is friends. You need to have blood, business, or a money connection in order to have 
um, insurable interest and friends don't have that. Now, if they're your business partner friend, then you're, they're your business partner, but just a friend, no. <coughs> Legal duties, standard of care, unbroken chain of events and actual loss or damage. What are all four of these? Ooh, <clears throat> um, elements of risk are actually due to chance, statistical probability, definite and measurable, not catastrophic. Those are elements of a risk. These are elements of negligence. So with negligence, you have a legal duty to act or not act. You're supposed to operate within a typical standard of care. Um, there is an unbroken chain of events, that proximate cause and then you actually got hurt. These are the four things you would need to prove if you wanted to sue somebody. So if you got hurt at McDonald's, you would have to prove they had a legal duty, they weren't within the standard of care, there was a proximate cause of unbroken chain of events, and you actually got hurt. And if you could prove all four of those, you can sue them and, and try to collect money. What is an example of absolute liability? Swimming pool, yes. Swimming pool, pet tigers, explosives are the three most common examples on the exam. Driving a car, I mean, I get it. Even having a kid, I'm like, you're absolutely responsible for your kid. Um, but driving a car, absolute liability is inherently dangerous. Swimming pools, animals, because I mean, yes, we love our little dogs. We don't think of our dogs as vicious animals, but at the end of the day, they are animals and they'll do what they want to do. Um, so even if we have the best, well-mannered, loving animal, it could still bite someone under the right conditions. So you're absolutely liable for your animal. And they usually won't use dogs. They'll use pet tiger. Um, swimming pools, absolutely liable. Explosives, absolutely liable. Like definitely, definitely dangerous. Driving a car isn't, I mean, yeah, it's, you know, kind of dangerous, but not nearly as likely to cause a problem, I guess. <laughs> but they don't see, they don't put that as absolute liability. All right, last question. We made it all the way to the end. Buildings constructed with masonry and or materials with fire resistant rating of two hours or more. Fire resistive, yes. So um, I actually just released a whole video on this um, in the gold package. But um, the key, when you read resist fire for two hours or more, that's fire resistant. So it's resisting fire. Um, so this, and this one has the best rating. Like when, if you want to insure a building and you can say my building is built with fire resistive materials, you will have the best insurance premium than someone else. So fire resistive is the, the best rating. All right, any questions? Let's see What's how we did. Masonry combustible. Masonry is um, built with, uh, ma masonry, when you think of masonry, I want you to think of like rocks, stone, brick. Um, mm -hmm. And I don't know if masonry combustible is an option. That might be a made up term. There's masonry, masonry frame which is like a combination of building and combustible materials but they really so did... brick. wait 
yeah, masonry is brick. But oh, okay. Fire, but fire is combustible. Okay. Live fire. <laughs> I'm sorry. Frame, wood, sticks. Sorry, frame. <laughs> when I said fire is combustible, I meant I meant frame, which is wood. But okay. masonry, I don't know. I I forget all of them. I have to look at a list. Because the thing is, they don't test too much on all of these. They test on the worst one and the best one. The best one is fire resistive. The worst one is frame. So frame is it's just made out of pure wood, basically. And wood is the most flammable thing you can have. We literally make fire with wood, right? It's like a matchstick. Uh-huh. Like matchsticks? Matchsticks is wood, it's, aren't they? Yes, but but also like if you built a house out of wood versus mm -hmm. building a house out of brick, mm -hmm. which one is going to burn up faster? Wood. Wood. Yeah. So wood yes. is the worst rating. So and that's frame. Frame is just wood. Gotcha. Uh, masonry is brick and stone, which doesn't burn too much, but it's not necessarily fire resistant. I mean, it can be depending on the type, but, but there's such a wide range between stones and bricks and cement, but masonry kind of includes all of those. Thank you. Uh, and last question. Red, um, I'm sorry. The red and the yellow are the most mm -hmm. testable ones. Can I ask a question about the last question? Yeah. Uh, absolute liability is trampoline absolute liability. I think so. Yeah. Pretty sure. Yeah. Thanks. Yep. Yeah, and, and insurance companies don't like trampolines. <laughs> Not a fan. They hate trampolines and swimming pools. Um, uh, so Ahmed asked when my next game night is. I don't have one on the calendar. Um, this is a busy month, which is why I was like, I have a free evening. I'll do it right now. Um, but I just got hired by two different insurance agencies to basically build a pre-licensing course. So um, I'm going to be busy B for a while. Um, so I don't, I don't know if we will be able to, to do that or not. Um, I am looking at bringing on some other instructors who can run some game nights. Um, and we also have the ultimate study buddy. We're talking about her running some games. She used to run game nights, but people wouldn't really show up. And so we'll start charging them money, which is why we got the $5 idea. Um, cause she was spending a lot of time blocking out her schedule and then people would book, but then not show up cause she was offering free game nights. So it was a, it was a very productive use of her time. So, um, but maybe we can get some more game nights going with her. So we'll, we'll see. All right. So let's can see how I we ask did. Something real quick. Um, yeah. How do you go about, so I was reading my laws and regulations and stuff. How would you go about I guess get say I'm in I'm in Michigan right now and I'm getting my licensing, um and say like I plan on moving in maybe April or August or something like that to the state of Texas. How could I get my license over there? Would I have to take this pre-licensing course again or? You need to see if they have what's called reciprocity, and most states do, but not every state does. Like Florida is pretty weird with their reciprocity. But reciprocity says, if you have a licensed agent in Michigan and we have a licensed agent in Texas, if our Texas agent moves to Michigan, you will give them a Michigan license. And if our Michigan resident moves to Texas, you will give them a Texas license. If they have reciprocity, they'll just switch them out. If they don't have reciprocity, then you might have to take a test again. So you would want to, you would want to, you would want to look it up. You would want to Google Texas Department of Insurance reciprocity. And, uh, but one way sometimes to work around it is to get a non-resident Texas. And then when you move there, you upgrade it to a resident Texas. Okay. But you got to check reciprocity. I don't, I don't have it memorized. Okay. I used to say that every state pretty much had reciprocity. And then I found out Florida doesn't. And I'm like, oops, never mind. Wow. Okay. Yeah, because technically Florida doesn't have a PNC license. They have a general lines license, which is PNC, but they call it different so they don't see it as reciprocity. 
All right, awesome. So these were our, our top winners. Again, it doesn't matter what your score is. It matters that you're learning and growing, but congrats to our first place, PJ, Delilah, second place, and CJ, third place. I'm so excited for you, CJ, to pass your exam. Yes. <laughs> he posts about it every day. I love it. <clears throat> All right. So 42% correct. Um, if we were to play this again, we would shoot for a 70, but um, I'm definitely calling it quits. Going to go have some hot tea maybe or something. All right. So any other final questions before we leave for the evening? Would you I would like to ask you. To, uh, I know this isn't part of your course, but I would be interested in recommendations for good companies to work for or good, if, if you have any recommendations on that. For PNC? Um, P, well, PNC is such a different ball game. Um, I mean, I worked for USAA. I loved them. <laughs> but they're like a call center. It really, it really depends on what kind of life you want to have. Do you want to work for your own? Do you want to work in a W-2 call center job? Like you really get to pick it all. And one of the things that I'll recommend to people is I don't, I don't really have a list of insurance companies or things like that. Uh, but you can ask in the group, you know, who are you guys working for? How do you like the experience? I mean, everybody's going to have a different experience. Um, but what I recommend is joining other insurance groups, finding somebody who you resonate with that's living the life you want to live and then do what they do. Like Joanna, she's somebody I would copy. She sells Medicare. She works mostly three months out of the year because that's Medicare open enrollment. And then the rest of the year, she's at cruises and conventions. Like if that's the kind of life you want to live, do what Joanna does. You know, so find an agent who's living a lifestyle you want, copy what they're doing, even ask to work for them. Say, what are you doing? I, I want to I wanna do that. <clears throat> that work at three months a year sounds good, but that's that's a different license. <laughs> it is. It's a health license. Yep. <laughs> Thank you. I appreciate it. Yep. Absolutely. Okay, okay, okay. I feel like I'm asking a lot of questions. Oh, you can go first. You go first. Thank you kindly. Uh, so hi, Tina here. I um I lucked out. I think uh, I got a job at State Farm. And he wanted me to crash uh, to take this course within like one to two weeks. He's like, yeah, everybody got it done within a week or two weeks. It's almost three weeks now and I'm not catching up. I'm like in chapter seven out of 15, literally just bought your package yesterday. Um, I don't know if you saw my messages. Well, you did. You answered uh, on Facebook, but is there a faster track? So that way he doesn't think I'm failing or what can I tell him? Focus on all my videos and then go back to your course. Okay, cool. Everything so I will make more sense after you watch mm -hmm. all of my videos. Yes, Melissa, correct. Can I just I chime in with something? So, you hear me? So, Am I being heard? so usually um, when you study, right, do you hand write down all your notes? Is that how you memorize everything? Or do you have any study tips? That's how I teach. I'll, I'll write, <laughs> I'll make charts and graphs, and then I encourage you to make them with me. And so you're writing them down, you're visualizing it, you're seeing it, you're hearing it. You're writing it, and then you get a chart that you have to study with. That's perfect. You hear Thank me, you so much. I you do, hear but me? there's a lot of I'll there's a lot of people too. talking at the same time. Thank you, Melissa. Want to that. <laughs> Sorry. Hey, Melissa. I just sent you a message, and and you know, in the chat, um, uh -huh. and about the payment. Um, you know, just let me know what. If I have to come back to the original uh, message that you sent me for tonight, because like I explained to you, I was having an issue with the PayPal. So I just want to make sure that I can submit the payment. Oh, for it. yeah, no worries. We'll check. I'll, I, we're, we're in email communication. All good. Okay, sweetheart. So yep. wait for you. Thank okay. you. It was great tonight. <laughs> awesome. All right, PJ. Uh, no, no, I'm good, but uh, yeah, just hanging out until, until you close it down. <laughs> okay, no problem. Stuff. You're awesome. Thank you so much. Oh, you're welcome. Thank you. And congrats on first place. Thank you. And congrats on your... Uh, your... Pregnancy, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yep, thank you. 22 weeks. Oh, you're 22 weeks along? Mm -hmm. That's why I stopped bleaching my hair. <laughs> oh, Okay. I like it. So everyone's like, your hair. And I'm like, well, I don't, I don't, I'm 
you know, <laughs> pregnant. So no more bleach for me. I'll probably, in, in fact, since, since I am growing, I mean, I'm just going to go natural gray. I'll still probably put color on top of this. The white will pick up color, but, um, yeah, that's why I stopped bleaching because I'm pregnant. This is trending now, so you don't have to touch or anything. Yeah. <laughs> Thanks so much, Melissa. Really girl? appreciate you. We don't know the we don't know the gender, but what's interesting is the dad is is a fan. He he met me on the YouTube channel, yeah. <laughs> so he was studying for his exam, and he asked me to call him, and I said no because <laughs> I don't I can't make outbound phone calls. <laughs> and he asked me to call him again, and I was like, okay, fine. When something made me want to call him, and it it all <laughs> it all worked out from there. <laughs> That's awesome. <clears throat> yep. All right. In fact, I'm going to probably go surprise him. He's playing pool and he likes me to go with him, but it's three nights a week. <laughs> so it's so like, I don't want to go sit at the bar while you play pool, but I'm going to go surprise him right now. So I'm going to let you guys know. Melissa. You're welcome. And I'll, so uh, much. it'll take about 24 to 48 hours to get this recording uploaded and I'll send it out to y'all. <clears throat> okay. Thank you. Bye. Yeah. Thank you. Good night. Be safe. Oh, love all the guys to pass your exam. Thanks. We need it. <laughs>